So today's topic is taking forward some of the topics that we've already discussed and applying them more directly to the built environment um, and to the evolution of the built environment, the evolution of cities and towns and architectures and how that has happened over history, uh, how we have generated our architectures and how that happens in the natural world as well. Uh, but we're gonna look a little more specifically at, at the human architectures this time. Um, and so what do we see when we look at great cities and buildings and towns and settlements? Um, you know, it's, I find it really fascinating to explore uh, these um, amazing places all over the world and how complex they are, how rich they are, how beautiful and, and intricate. And there are things that we can learn, I think, that are directly applicable to our challenges today, not, again, just copying the look of them, but understanding the deeper generative forces and how they're working and how they could be harnessed, uh, perhaps, uh, today. And I'm going to start with uh, an old, uh, wonderful old book, uh, not that old, actually, goes back to the time of Jane Jacobs and, and uh, Christopher Alexander and others, another person who from the, about that time who was really an important thinker, I think, uh, Kevin Lynch, who's known best for his book uh, called um, uh, who's known best for uh, his, his book, The Image of the City. Um, and uh, this book is a little less well known, but it's also, I think, a very important book. Um, and in this book, he asked the question, what do we mean when we think about good city form? And he, he posits that we have to talk about what we mean by good. Uh, that is a normative theory. Why, is, why are some settlements better than others? Why are some structures better than others? And he says, you know, anytime you're making a decision about urban policy or allocation of resources, or design, uh, you have to have norms, you have to apply norms, uh, short range, long range, broad or selfish, implicit or explicit. The values that you use to make those decisions are inevitable ingredients of the decision. And uh, without some sense of better, you're just going to drift and you're going to have perverse consequences. You're not gonna know that you're moving in the direction of your goals, right? Uh, and when, furthermore, when values lie unexamined, they are dangerous. If you say, oh, well, I don't really have any, any values, I don't really have a normative theory of the city, that's probably not true. You probably have one and you're not putting it on the table and you're not being transparent about it. And that is very dangerous when you have hidden actors with hidden motives who are uh, participating in the life of the city and, and shaping its outcomes, um, often the results are not uh, good for most people. <clears throat> so that's what really being a democracy is all about, being a um, participatory city where there's some level of co-creation. Um, and obviously we want to promote health and well-being, security, freedom from pathogens, uh, social interaction, and so on. We want to uh, promote ecological health, uh, climate stability, sustainable uh, ecosystem services, the things that the environment gives to us, the benefits, clean water and clean air and so on, food stocks, fisheries, and so on and economic vitality, uh, the ability to uh, develop uh, and improve our, our quality of life, our, our uh, health and um, uh, benefits that we have access to, the ability to have exchange and commerce, access to resources, economic diversity, which is, again, as Jacob said, diversity is a good thing, including economic diversity and uh, urban synergies of various kinds. We were talking about the uh, why cities are greener than other kinds of settlements, uh, remarkable green dividend there, and just the broader topic of sustainability, how we can make cities more sustainable over time. Um, so we can go beyond that, actually, we can start talking about topics of uh, beauty, which is sort of a word that isn't used much these days, because it's considered uh, to be in the eye of the beholder or are um, you know, a relative uh, concept that is different for different people. And there's some differences obviously, but what some of the new sciences in uh, fields like neuroscience and environmental psychology are showing is there's a lot of consensus. There's a lot of shared 
uh, impacts uh, and evaluations that people make about beauty. And there is a relationship to um, the degree to which we feel well and we feel that our, our well being is promoted in, a, in an environment when we consider it beautiful, when we consider it uh, biophilic or natural, uh, you know, vegetation and water and sunlight and so on. We'll talk about that a little more uh, in a later, uh, a later place. And then how do we uh, apply that to specific places? Uh, uh, this was one case study that we were looking at uh, 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 with one, some of my students earlier. Um, and so when, when we were talking about what urban design is, we talked a little bit about the idea that it's, you're mediating between conflicting freedoms. Anytime we come together in a city or any kind of settlement, we're constraining each other's freedoms. We get something, but we lose something. We lose the freedom that we might have out in the middle of the wilderness, right? Uh, and um, Oliver Wendell Holmes was famous for saying, my freedom to swing my fist ends at your nose. And the closer you get to me, the closer your nose gets to me, the more my freedom is constrained by your proximity. So we need to work out <clears throat> the ways to mediate between those conflicting freedoms. <clears throat> and we were talking also a little bit about the, how we can um, uh, do that in an urban context. We can maybe change the degree to which we are private versus we are public. We can go out into the public realm or we can retreat into our private <clears throat> spaces within the uh, place network, as I described it earlier. The ability to walk, to get to our needs when we need to, uh, or choose other modes if they're available to us. But many people cannot drive, for example, in the car. <clears throat> so if you have a car dependent city, you're limiting many people's freedoms. Uh, the elderly, uh, the children, uh, those who are um, uh, unable to drive for medical reasons, or, or other reasons, uh, or just can't afford to drive, uh, many people uh, cannot. And, and so that is a, is a form of injustice, really, to deprive large parts of the population of the ability to, uh, to get to where they need to go uh, if they can't walk, <clears throat> if they can only drive. Uh, parents become taxi drivers for their kids and so on, mothers especially, quite often. And obviously to access employment and the resources that we need when we're in the city, uh, the freedom to be stimulated, to enjoy the beauty of the city, to get out and walk and exercise, the freedom from danger and disruption. Um, and uh, obviously that's an important factor. So in the book, uh, Lynch describes five different variables that he posits as values that we should um, consider as elements of a good city form. One of them is vitality, the degree to which the form supports vital function, biological requirements, uh, sense, the clarity with which that can be perceived and identified. We have to be able to navigate and wayfind through the city. And uh, we need to link those uh, elements with other events and places in a coherent mental representation um, that can be connected with non-spatial concepts and values. I wanna go out and be part of the culture, be part of the nightlife, be part of the uh, you know, celebrations that are going on. But in order to do that, I need to understand where those are and how those are interrelated with the patterns of space in the city. This is the insight of uh, image of the city, Lynch's other um, great book, better known book actually. Uh, fit is how well the spatial and temporal pattern matches the customary behavior of the inhabitants, how well we can, can it's, the city accommodates our ability to move, you know, things are closer together, things are where they need to be, they fit uh, together with each other and with ourselves, uh, the uh, spatial proximity and walkability and so on. Access, similar to mobility, but also the ability to reach those things um, as, as good distribution, uh, good ability to connect these elements uh, by pathways, uh, streets and tracks and pathways and so on. And by the way, this is uh, also related to fit, but fit is more like the overall configuration and, and access is how the degree to which you can actually access those things. And then control, we talked about that the other day and um, the degree to which the use and access the spaces are controlled by those who, who use work or reside in them. In other words, we can 
um, be affected by the presence, use, action, appropriation, uh, a modification and disposition uh, within a given space. We can shape the space. We can uh, interact with the space and get it to adapt to our needs more, more carefully. Um, so those are the five performance variables that he describes in the book. And then he describes two meta criteria. Uh, one is efficiency. Uh, it relates the level of achievement in some performance to a loss in some other. In other words, it's an optimization. It's never perfect, but it's, you can improve it. You can make it more optimal. Um, and you can make it more efficient. You can make the uh, distribution of destinations more efficient for a pedestrian, for example. And also justice, which is in a similar vein, the balancing criterion between people so that there aren't some people who are deprived of access, like if they can't drive an automobile and it's a car dependent community, uh, that's not an optimal uh, condition of justice. And these two meta criteria are important because the other five may be in conflict. You know, you may not be able to drive uh, because you're you're infirm, but driving is is um, a way that people are uh, maximizing their ability to get to work or something like that. So the other five may be in conflict and have to be optimized. They have to be optimized between each other, and that's the efficiency. And they have to be optimized for everybody, and that's the justice part of it. So that's Lynch's sort of overarching theory of good city form, that if a city can provide this to us, then we are uh, going to find that to be a better city from a human point of view. Um, and then in the next section of the book is quite fascinating. He describes how through history, different forms of cities have evolved. And he talks about three different forms. One is the the cosmic form of the city. This is a fairly top-down model where you have a, a view of how the cosmos is ordered, uh, and then you take that model and impose it upon the city. So it might be a sort of north, south, east, west, the pattern of the, the way the sun moves, the settlement is organized in the same way that the sun moves, or the, uh, the sort of grid that you see as the cosmic pattern. Um, and the other model is the mechanical model. And we've seen how, especially in the coming into the late 19th and early 20th century, that became a major model that, that you're pulling the parts of the city apart and putting them into a machine-like configuration, uh, functionally segregating and then recombining them into some mechanical ordering and then connecting them often by mechanical systems. Uh, uh, me uh, mechanical uh, vehicles of various kinds, automobiles and, and transit uh, vehicles and so on. Uh, and it, that's the mechanical model. Then he talks about the organic model, which is what we might think of as the more bottom up uh, kind of city. And th these are the ones that are more spontaneous uh, that have grown over time through the, the self-organizing actions of the agents. And uh, the point that Lynch makes is that they are various combinations of all these three and various examples of all three in throughout history. Uh, and for example, you can see the, the cosmic model, you can see a star pattern, you can see a satellite pattern, you can see a, a linear city, uh, you can see the grid city of various kinds and the grid isn't always uniform. It can be deformed and deflected, uh, but it's overall is a grid-like pattern. And then there are variations of the grid, there are Baroque axial patterns, lace work, uh, inward turning cities, fortified cities, uh, nested cities where you have concentric uh, <clears throat> rings and, and perimeters of private space, relatively private space. And then various kinds of uh, fantasy cities, you might say, current imaginings, he refers to them, of how maybe we would settle in space and so on. Um, and then again, he he categorizes these and he looks at examples of them and how they are uh, often either dispersed or centralized or linear, uh, and then uh, different kinds of structure that uh, that combine those different patterns of city form over time. And then of course, there's the more organic city where you still have different types. Uh, he refers to them as the, the irregular. Uh, fine, scale, ang ang fine scale angular, the regular orthogonal, uh, mixture of regularity and irregularity, and then uh, 
um, uh, road geometry that's curvilinear or rectilinear, a more modern sort of uh, cul-de-sac or, or sprawling, we would say, city form. Um, and then the various configurations of those where sometimes they're much more rectilinear than they are organic. Um, and so that's, a, I commend that book to you. It's a fascinating uh, book uh, and Lynch's work in general is fascinating and important. I think I mentioned Image of the City, which is also one of the, one of the landmark texts, certainly in the urban design world. And I think we, we all uh, owe a debt of gratitude to, uh, to Lynch for formulating some of the ideas there. Um, so in the next section of the talk, I wanna back up though, and I wanna talk about the, you know, more broadly the evolution of cities because we've only been making cities for about 10,000 years, but we've been actually, we've, we've existed as a species depending upon how you define it for much longer than that for about 200 or 300,000 years. Uh, and this is uh, the kinds of settlements that we've been making. Obviously, we think about the classic sort of cave settlement and so on. This is Blombo's cave in Africa, right on the uh, Southern African coast. And it's quite fascinating that this is a fairly recent discovery. And we see that there are signs, clear signs of culture there. There's what appears to be artwork and beautifully crafted uh, symbolic uh, spear tips that are, don't seem to be particularly functional. They seem to be aesthetic uh, more than functional. And they're 70,000 years old, which is much older than we thought really human culture as we think of it today evolved art and language and so on. And so this is what I would call the 200,000 year story going back before the beginning of cities and how we became the tool using, language using, technological beings that later on went to develop cities. Uh, and I think this is, a, this is crucial in understanding where we are today to really get the big picture of our own evolution. Remember this talk is about evolution and about human evolution and city evolution in particular. So we'll start really uh, back far in time about 200,000 years ago. And it's amazing what we have learned in the last uh, decade or two about human migration patterns Thanks to the genetic technology that we have, we're now able to really map out in much clearer detail how humans have migrated around the, around the globe. Um, and when this happened, you know, 50,000 years ago or so, uh, the sort of out of Africa <clears throat> model as it's referred to. And we're not only recognizing that that's what happened, but that we can now see where people actually went around the globe and when they, when they went there. We can also see the divergence between Homo sapiens and the, the Neanderthal. You can see the Neanderthal uh, skeleton on the left there. And you can see the divergence of technology as well. Uh, and the Neanderthal technology was very robust and very effective. You know, you have to credit Neanderthals for being incredible survivors. They existed for hundreds of thousands of years. Their technology was more sophisticated than we used to give it credit for, but it was fairly undifferentiated because it was tried and true. You know, it was spears, it was um, uh, hunting methodologies, it was, was uh, being able to go into the cold environments with uh, animal skins and so on. So it was a very effective technology in that sense, but it didn't differentiate much as opposed to the Homo sapiens technology, which became much more differentiated and much more uh, um, uh, uh, complex in the sense of having many different kinds of spear tips, many different kinds of, of technologies for things like baskets and fish hooks and, and other devices for gathering food and for, for uh, harvesting food uh, uh, from different sources, many different sources than the Neanderthals had. And we think now that the reason that all happened was that in conditions changed in the African continent. There was a mega drought about 200,000 years ago uh, that was a shock, a disruptor to the technology for the humans who were there at the time. In fact, they had to um, move to the coast and, and become sort of hunkered down on the coast and become a much smaller population. In fact, almost extinct. There were probably less than a thousand human beings at one point, Homo sapiens, which is you know an endangered species by any definition. 
Um, and uh, this was a, a climate change event. It's ironic to think that uh, climate change was such an impact upon our evolutionary history that we were in a way creatures of climate change. And uh, the, the entire African continent became much, much drier. It actually became colder, not warmer. And many of the, the uh, fauna that we hunted, the megafauna, the, the animals, that we had hunted and relied upon uh, went extinct or became so uh, scarce that we couldn't uh, reliably hunt them anymore. So again, we moved to the coast, we innovated, we began to do things like uh, create uh, fish hooks and baskets and do things like uh, gather food from the oceans and from, you know, begin to develop technologies for fishing and for other kinds of, of hunting and gathering and, and uh, other ways of uh, surviving in that environment, in that very harsh condition. And probably uh, the evolution of language was greatly influenced by that event as well. And symbolic uh, language, the ability to exchange information about uh, strategies that we needed to, uh, to be able to survive. So we now think that this was a formative event in, in the evolution of Homo sapiens, that we were essentially forced by climate change to innovate and to become the kind of technological species that we are now, the species that used more language, used more technologies, more fish hooks, more different kinds of spears and, and atlatls and other devices for uh, hunting uh, game and, and gathering uh, food of various kinds. So if you think about the scale of human history, it's quite breathtaking really to think about it and to think about where we are today and where we've come as a species. If you take the history of Homo sapiens and uh, you know, going back 250,000 years, let's say, it, it goes all the way off the chart because as you'll see in a moment, I had to compress this chart a little bit, but here's the span of city making. It's only about 10,000 years, right? So that's uh, 25 times longer than the, uh, the era of city making that we're in today. Um, and here's the span of industrial technology, only about 300 years or so. Um, and the span of most climate models today is only about 100 years. So it's a tiny, tiny fraction of our evolutionary history. And if you begin to think, well, what happens when you push the line out on the other side and you go 10,000 years or 100,000 years, it's, it's uh, staggering to think and staggering to think of what the impact might be of uh, increasing the uh, CO2 equivalent uh, gases in the atmosphere uh, and what uh, other impacts we might have from climate change and from other challenges that we, we ourselves are creating now. And here, of course, is the span of what we call sustainable buildings, only about 40 years or so. Um, and, uh, many of the mechanical systems are only 15 or 20 years of life cycle. So clearly we're thinking in very, very short time spans these days, and we ought to step back, and especially if we're thinking about sustainability, uh, and think about where we are in the big picture and where we're going and how we're going to get there. And I think this understanding of climate change in, as, a, as a shaping force in human history um, is very, very important. If you think about the African mega drought of about 195,000 years ago or so to 100,000 uh, in, in the, that middle period. And then the period about 10,000 years ago when we were coming out of the ice age, uh, the last ice age, and uh, at just about that time, we dipped back into uh, a mini ice age known as the younger driest period. Um, but that was also a formative event because what do you know, humans at that time were already, it appears, doing rudimentary forms of agriculture and uh, you know, following herds around as nomads uh, and uh, uh, sometimes maybe catching some of those herds and keeping them around. Suddenly, 10,000 years ago, we began to hunker down in one spot and try to grow those crops in one place and try to keep those herds in one place. Uh, we developed animal husbandry, we developed agriculture, and we developed cities right around that time. And that is not a coincidence, it appears. This was a response to the changing conditions of that time, the, the, the mini ice age uh, that was happening around that time that didn't allow us to um, do the things that we were doing before. 
Um, and lo and behold, you see in many different parts of the globe, actually, um, stable settlements, proto cities, uh, towns or even villages, we would call them today, much smaller than what we think of as cities today. But nonetheless, they were the proto cities. Um, that arose as a result of the climate change conditions that were happening at that time, a fascinating insight, I think. Um, and of course, wh where we are today has a lot to do with uh, cities and the evolution of cities, as uh, uh, my friend Herbert Giraday and Tier Dilstra uh, point out, um, this is the dominant feature of the human presence on earth and the sprawling patterns, the uh, inefficient patterns, the patterns that are depleting resources and emitting into the atmosphere are profoundly changing humanity's relationship to our host planet and its ecosystems. Not the first time that uh, uh, biological systems have changed uh, non-biological systems, by the way, if you look back at the, uh, the change in the atmosphere from uh, increasing levels of oxygen from living uh, systems. So we're, we're doing it again, and this time we're creating all kinds of new impacts. Um, and th certainly it appears that cities are going to play an outsized role for better or worse, that's where human destiny will be played out, as they say, where the future of the biosphere will be determined. So what happens today in cities uh, is very, very important. Cities and towns and suburbs and sprawling, um, sprawling countryside and all the rest of it. So we do need to understand, going back to Jacobs, the kind of problem a city is, the kind of problem urban design is, ultimately a problem of technology. Uh, because technology at its heart is nothing other than the knowledge of making, of working with parts and holes and assembling the parts or differentiating the parts or, um, you know, manipulating, really manipulating the holes to make, to transform them into other holes as Christopher Alexander described. And um, Herbert Simon uh, put it that way, everyone designs who seeks to to change existing conditions to preferred ones, or you might say, um, modifying that a little bit, design is the transformation of existing states into preferred ones. Um, we're all designers in a sense. We are all uh, seeking to change something about our world uh, from the existing state into a preferred one. And so I love that, that the definition of design because if you think about it, um, it, actually raises more questions than it answers. Um, but they are absolutely the right questions that we need to be thinking about when we think about design. Who is doing the preferring, right? How do they know what they prefer? What if the what they prefer changes along the way? How do they know how to get from the existing state to the preferred one? Uh, how do they even understand what the existing state really is? If they are confused about that, maybe they're not going to make any progress and so on. And how do different people who might prefer different things uh, resolve those differences and, and work something out where they can achieve something in common? All of those kinds of questions, I think, are very fascinating and, and very important. They're at the heart of what design is and what planning is and what technology is, ultimately, because technology is design. We're using uh, the knowledge of making, the techne logos, to shape our world in some way, to uh, create devices, create means, create pathways from existing states to preferred ones. And you can see that in cities uh, all the way through history, going back to the oldest cities and even today, some of the examples of African uh, settlements, for example, that have very complex networks of, of essentially private spaces uh, that are in semi-private spaces and, and delimited uh, compounds and, and sub-compounds and subspaces and, and larger spaces nested within each other with, again, a little bit of overlap, a little bit of tangle sometimes, but um, very complex, again, place network, uh, going back to the many, many of the oldest settlements. Uh, and you can see examples of this. These is in Africa. Again, these are the, the villages that are uh, have the various huts that have the families and and the kinship groups of various uh, sizes and levels, a very polycentric system. You'll notice there's a lot of little ones and a lot of medium sized ones and some, a fewer number of big ones um, at many different scales, a kind of fractal uh, relationship of the scales there. And this idea, again, that there are boundaries, that 
that there's something that's a membrane-like structure in all of these settlements, all of these spaces uh, that allow some things to come in but exclude other things. And uh, through gateways, through fences, through boundaries of various kinds, that's what uh, cities are, what settlements are, what buildings are. They're very much like the, the membranes of cells that create these boundaries that enclose some kind of space that's uh, that we would say is more private than the space outside of it, uh, more controlled, more protected in some way. Um, this is Ur, this is one of the oldest uh, cities, uh, settlements in, in Babylon. Uh, you can see the, the, the complex uh, structure. There's a lot of rather formal structures, very sort of rectangular grid-like patterns, but there's also an irregularity about it as well. And you can see the sort of adaptive iteration that has shaped that over time. Uh, the, again, the bottom up and the top down working together. Uh, here's a, a, an inset of that area where you can see some of the more formal courtyards. Remember going back to Lynch, the more cosmic idea that you're, you're aligning that with the pattern of the sun with the north and the south and the, the pattern of stars and so on, uh, aligning your city with the cosmic order. Um, and then here is uh, Babylon at about 600 BC. Uh, you can see temples and you know, work, sites of worship, very symbolic cities, very axial uh, processional streets and so on. Uh, again, the more cosmic model. This is in uh, Mexico, um, the uh, uh, Aztec, cities uh, that are very, uh, actually this may be Mayan, come to think of it, uh, that are very, uh, again, rectilinear and cosmically oriented, uh, north and south, with the pattern of the sun, the movement of the sun. Uh, the, uh, Teotihuacan in uh, Mexico, uh, very beautiful, very uh, hierarchically arranged, um, orderly, cosmic kind of city pattern. But you can see, if you look at it carefully, there's a lot of complexity there too, a lot of sort of bottom-up organization of the surrounding structures and the, um, the different kinds of uh, uh, informal spaces and, and informal uh, structures that uh, residents have built for themselves in many cases, the distributed agents of the city that are building all these different parts of the city with a, a a, a certain kind of order to it that's emergent, as well as the more top-down order, the axial patterns and the temples and so on. Uh, this is in Asia, um, uh, an example of a, of a city, no, sorry, this is a, again, uh, uh, Tenochtitlan, I believe, and this is a former Mexico city. Um, so this is, uh, this is going back to Lynch again, talking about how these cosmic cities evolved uh, all around the world. This is an example from China a very similar pattern, the grid-like pattern. And that grid-like pattern did evolve as a reflection of the cosmic order, what was seen to be the cosmic order, because again, the east and west was the axis of the sun, right? And north and south was perpendicular to that and so on. Um, and, and you could align with the sun by aligning your house to the south, you would get the most southern exposure or to the north if you wanted shade and so on. Um, same thing with the Greeks. Uh, often the, what the Greeks did was to, to create uh, military settlements. Uh, Sparta, for example, was a military camp, and that had a very uh, a particular grid pattern to it that you see in many examples uh, where, uh, the, uh, again, the fortifications form the perimeter of the, of the uh, settlement, and then you have a, a very clear grid-like layout um, and this is true for Roman settlements as well, going back to the castrum pattern, uh, the Roman castrum uh, that you can see in, in many examples around the world. And it, again, it doesn't need to be a perfect grid, but it needs to, it will typically be a rough grid that is very clearly organized. And the, the main thing is the, uh, the crossing uh, where the main north, south and east, west streets intersect. And here's an example of that from, uh, this is Trento, Italy. And this is the more orderly settlement that you could see historically. And this is in the medieval period. But before that, it was even more orderly with again, the north, south and east, west crossing. But what you can see there uh, happening is that the city is um, somewhat uh, rigidly constructed with the very clear north, south, 
at east-west patterns. But what's also happening is people are making minor adjustments and adaptations and changes over time, and they're beginning to create deflections in that grid and mutations of the grid that make it less angular and less uh, uh, rigid and straight and deflecting it more and more and more over time to the point that when you look at it as it is today, watch this very carefully, this is the city today. Now, what you see is it's much more irregular, much more deflected and organic, if you will. So what you can see is that the top down, it is not only a difference between the sort of top down city and the bottom up city, but often they're combined in interesting ways. And often uh, the top down, uh, is overlain with the bottom up over time. The bottom up sort of emerges and deflects the top down and then vice versa. Sometimes the, uh, the top down will be imposed upon the bottom up like Haussmann's boulevards that were sliced through the organic fabric of Paris. That's another example of how that happens. So here's this deflection pattern again. You notice also that the river, uh, the course of the river has been changed as well. Uh, so that today it runs uh, pretty far to the west. Remember when we were talking about the, the Mississippi the other day and the way uh, river uh, courses are often changed sometimes by, by human beings. Uh, if they need that space for whatever reason, uh, they will deflect the river um, and sometimes with tragic consequences as we saw in New Orleans. But um, Trento is a very beautiful city. I had the pleasure of visiting there for several months at the university and teaching and doing research. And it was, uh, I could tell you that it is a very livable city, very walkable, uh, I would say with Kevin Lynch's criterion, a very good city, uh, good access to all of the needs uh, on bicycle and, and on foot, as well as the car. You can use the car for some of the uh, surrounding destinations if you need to. Uh, but my, my colleague there, uh, who was my host, actually didn't own a car and didn't need to. So this idea that the grid pattern is a pervasive pattern in human settlements uh, extends around the world. This is again in, uh, in the, uh, the Americas. This is a, the, something known as the laws of the Indies, a pattern that the Spanish imposed upon the new world. Uh, and it was a code that they essentially said, you will build your cities in this way, you will have a central square, it will have a church on it, it will have a market on it, it will have a grid of streets radiating out from that pattern and so on. And you can see many, many examples of cities that even today still have that pattern, uh, Santa Barbara in the US, uh, San Juan, uh, Santa Clara in Cuba, uh, San Salvador, uh, uh, Panama City, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can see uh, uh, in New Mexico, for example, Santa Fe, uh, that's uh, Santa Fe there on the right with the luminarius lighting up the square uh, and Albuquerque and many other cities uh, around the world. It's been a very effective pattern, a very effective code because it's quite simple and quite robust and it allows a little bit of adjustment and deflection and, you know, you can see, for example, on the uh, the middle left example, I believe that's Querétaro, Mexico, and there's still a little bit of deflection that the streets don't have to be perfectly uh, rigid in that model. But then you go to Guanajuato, Mexico, where they were actually building the, the settlement in a canyon, and they couldn't apply the uh, laws of the Indies code, so they just sort of let it go as a organic city. And the contrast between Guanajuato and Querétaro, which are two cities that are very close to one another is quite remarkable, quite wonderful really, I think, because they're both very beautiful cities, but in very different ways. Guanajuato is a much more irregular sort of, um, you know, self-organizing uh, organic pattern, almost like a hill town of Italy uh, with the deflected views and spaces and the irregularity following the topography and so on. Um, and yet that works too in its own way. So each of these strategies has its value and they can have value even when they're combined as well as we've seen with the uh, example from Trento uh, and uh, many other examples where for example in Siena, uh, the, the great square was created as a very conscious decision by the different uh, neighborhoods in the different um, um, uh, parts of the city, the, the tribe, tribal uh, nature of the city where they would actually allocate a sort of slice of that, uh, of that main space to different tribes and they would have their 
festivals there and their competitions there and so on. And then they would all come together into the church. And yet the organic shape of the city can be seen all around it, all around that much more formal uh, centralized space, a uh, consciously created space. Uh, this is Bologna, Italy. And you can see that although it's very irregular, very organic, it also has a very clear sort of high, uh, a very clear street grid that you can see uh, pervading the pattern of the city. And the big loop around it was a defensive uh, wall that existed at one time and is now a, a ring road. Um, Pisa, Italy, I showed this slide before of how the different spaces can kind of self-organize into uh, spatial regions, spatial rooms, urban rooms or, or place network. Um, th these are other examples of much more formal cities uh, uh, and uh, many different kinds of settlements, much more irregular examples like here in, uh, in, in Rome, uh, Ravenna, Salzburg, Pisa, Dresden, where you have the church and you have some kind of a square that has a relationship to the church, but not necessarily a rigid relationship. It can be quite deflected and quite loose, uh, but there's still a logic to it. There's still a, a fundamental relationship between the building and the public space and the things that are in the public space, whether it's fountains or other small pavilions or chapels or other structures. And then, as I mentioned, the Paris of Haussmann, where um, uh, the boulevards were sliced through that very irregular urban fabric, creating a much more sort of rigid, formal, uh, Baroque pattern of streets, uh, grand avenues and boulevards uh, running through the city, uh, aligning with the grand uh, uh, civic buildings. Um, and then in the, in the United States, in the New World, uh, the grid pattern was applied to many of the cities that were part of the English tradition. This is Savannah, uh, which was planned by uh, Oglethorpe, uh, the general from uh, the English general, who uh, had a certain sort of military uh, mentality, you might say, and you can see it in this very almost like military camp layout of the streets and squares. And yet Savannah is a wonderful city, actually, this pattern this grid-like pattern worked extremely well, partly because the scale was so ideal. The scale of these squares and the way the streets worked as a network going around the squares and then also going through the squares and slowing down the vehicles, uh, in our case, cars, but back then they were carts and wagons and so on. And this is what Savannah looks like today. You can see the squares, uh, the big green uh, squares, and then the, the streets, uh, the, the bigger, streets, the avenues and boulevards, the multi-way boulevards with medians uh, in the middle, and then the, um, the, the different squares with the smaller streets and the wards surrounding them. Quite a wonderful, beautiful, very walkable and bikeable city as well. There's one of the boulevards running through with the median. Um, there's the pathways that cut through the squares so that vehicles can't take these very easily, but pedestrians and bicycles can. They can get right through uh, into the heart of the city, into the main uh, main shopping district and so on. And then this is Washington DC uh, planned by L'Enfant, the French uh, planner who was using the uh, Baroque model of uh, sort of axial um, boulevards that, that uh, act, uh, aimed at um, various monuments of various kinds. And in this case, there's the Capitol, you can see in the, in the lower central area there, and then the uh, axial uh, Pennsylvania Boulevard that goes to the White House, and then all the other boulevards that radiate out away from there. So you have a very simple grid pattern uh, of you know, streets, and, streets and squares. And then you have on top of that, this slicing through boulevard pattern that's actually quite wonderful and creates very interesting little triangular spaces. And many of those are triangular gardens and other kinds of spaces that are quite wonderful. And you'll see this pattern in many other examples, by the way, you think about how Broadway in New York slices through at an angle against the, the simple grid of, of upper New York. Um, and create some wonderful little spaces. Times Square, for example, is one of those, and many other uh, quite uh, uh, wonderful, uh, delightful 
irregular spaces, triangular spaces and so on. Uh, and that's a pattern you see over and over again. Uh, this Baroque model uh, was applied in many other cities. This is an example from Portland, Oregon, uh, known as Lad's edition. And again, you can see that they took the simple grid that existed on the uh, surrounding urban fabric and they rotated it 90 degrees or at least rotated part of it to create this sort of X shaped pattern, these axes that, that go through to the central garden in the middle, and then also these diamond shaped squares that radiate out from that that are also uh, similar to the savanna pattern, really these little squares that interrupt the uh, through movement of vehicles, but uh, it's still very well connected, very walkable and bikeable as well as accessible to, uh, to vehicles. Uh, and this is what it looks like, again, when you get these angular spaces, these little triangular plazas and other sort of wonderful spaces, and you get the variation of the street type so that if you're in a, in a car, for example, you're not likely to go through the neighborhood to get to wherever you're going on the other side of it. Uh, you're going to probably go on the larger street there. Uh, the, which has four lanes, but also has on-street parking. And by the way, they've recently converted that to three lanes. They've done what they call a road diet. Um, and it still has about the same uh, mobility uh, as it has with four lanes because you, you don't need to uh, stop when a car is turning left and so on. Um, so it, this is actually a wonderful pattern. Uh, and Portland, as I said, offers us many uh, interesting and instructive examples of of urban uh, urban form that is quite successful, quite good urban form, I would say. Um, and again, it doesn't have to look perfectly uh, rectilinear. It can be uh, quite uh, chaotic looking, and yet there's an overall order to it. This is Uranienborg in uh, Oslo, Norway. And what you can see is, again, it's a very uh, uh, grid-like pattern. If you look carefully, you can see that the main major streets running through here and here, uh, and even in the diagonal, um, uh, do follow a more or less grid-like pattern. You can begin to see that a little better here in the drawing of it when it was first platted, uh, that uh, there are there is a regularity to it. And it's simply that the grid is rotating, it's transforming, responding to other streets that were already there, deflecting to accommodate the terrain and so on. And again, it's a very wonderful uh, walkable, bikeable space as well as accessible to vehicles uh, even today. And here's one of the principal streets that runs through that has streetcars and uh, uh, allows uh, vehicles, allows cars, but also is very pedestrian friendly and, and bike friendly, a very multimodal street, a very uh, successful uh, mixed use street or high street. Um, and this is the, the light rail line that runs through as well. So, you know, you have many different ways to get around uh, not only the, uh, the streetcar, uh, walking, biking, uh, um, tram, uh, bus, um, and of course, uh, you can drive if you need to drive, if you have the, uh, the ability to do that or take a taxi or an Uber or whatever. And here's another uh, shot of the same street we were looking at before, where you can see what a dynamic place it is, what a sort of um, remarkable sidewalk ballet, as Jane Jacobs referred to it, is going on there with this mix of people and activities and movement and, and uh, experience, interaction with one another, uh, accessing their resources, accessing fresh food, uh, accessing employment, uh, and so on. And the, many of these are immigrants, by the way. So it's, a, it's, it's rungs of the ladder. It's places where people can find work and they can perhaps open their own little shop and they can actually uh, uh, develop economically, develop culturally, develop as human beings, develop their health and their well-being, which is what cities ultimately give us, right? Um, and uh, then here's another example. Uh, this is over on the other side of Oslo, I believe, where you can see a more sort of rectilinear uh, pattern. Uh, and then what we began to do though, uh, as again, we began to get onto a slippery slope in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. We began to um, think of our cities in, in perhaps too top-down a way. We began to pull apart the components of the city and emphasize perhaps too much the sort of monumental scale, the sort of God's eye view or bird's eye view of the city and the great 
uh, civic uh, uses and so on. And this happened in many cities in Washington, DC and many other places where we took out many of the more diverse uses that were going on and left only the great monuments and the great sort of you know, beautiful uh, axial uh, views and axial boulevards and so on. And that had, had profound consequences for the dynamics of the city, for the city would empty out at you know, 5 p.m. and then it would become a very uh, dangerous place, uh, for example. And, and this is not just an aesthetic issue because often these were very beautiful cities. That was the idea of the city beautiful. Uh, this was the famous white city that was the ex exhibition for the World's Fair, the Chicago World's Fair. Uh, a, a remarkable exhibit, and yet it's not a real city at all. It's a it's a gigantic pavilion or a series of pavilions uh, that are uh, there's no residences there at all. There's no shops to speak of there other than just what people are vending as part of the exhibition. Um, and this is what we did to city after city after city. We pulled all the other uses out of it. In Washington, D.C., we did that so that now the mall is almost entirely composed of civic buildings and museums and uh, you know, government buildings and, and monuments and so on. Um, city after city, we did that. There's the white uh, city again uh, for the World's Fair. Uh, very beautiful, but again, and then we began to build that pattern all over the United States and all over many other parts of the world as well. The sort of radiant city, a, a beautiful city, a city beautiful. Uh, this is Laurelhurst uh, in, in Portland. Um, and this is now a residential neighborhood that's only residential. There's uh, essentially no uh, civic uses or no, uh, sorry, no commercial uses in that. There is a school in the center. Uh, uh, but again, the civic uses are way out on the perimeter here. We're gonna pull everything apart again. We're gonna rationalize it. And we're still doing that. Unfortunately, we're sort of hollowing out parts of our cities and turning them into various kinds of grand uh, civic spaces that don't have any real activities in them other than the gathering for those civic activities, uh, which again, only occur very, very rarely in, in the life of the city. Uh, and this is what's going on with some of our landscaping schemes where we just, we think that somehow carpeting everything in green is going to make it magically wonderful. Well, it, it does it if you don't have the uses. Jane Jacobs made that point. You need the mix of activities, the mix of people, the mix of times of day, not just during the, you know, during the middle of the day when the civic activities are going on. And we talked about Ebenezer Howard and how he had pulled the different parts of the city apart and moved many of them off into the countryside in order to improve the quality of life of the residents. But by doing so, he pulled the life out of the city, really, and created what uh, was really the prototype of the modern American suburb uh, with the best of intentions. Uh, there's Welland Garden City on the right. Um, this is an, another one of them on the left. Um, this is the famous Clarence Perry diagram that we saw earlier. Again, again, pulling the parts of the neighborhood apart now at the neighborhood scale and cutting it off from the surrounding urban fabric with highways and with major arterials that are now going to be so busy with vehicles that you, the pedestrians are going to fear for their lives. Uh, and we're going to kill a lot of pedestrians, by the way, which we certainly have over the years. And we're only going to put the civic uses in the middle. We're only going to put the commercial uses at the edges. We're going to pull apart uh, the neighborhood, as I said before. And there are various permutations of that. This is the so-called Radburn uh, layout on the right that you see where there's there's not much interconnectivity within the neighborhood at all. Uh, there's a lot of sort of dead end pathways and cul-de-sacs that that uh, that enter the city from or the neighborhood from the from the perimeter, but don't cross uh, the neighborhood at all and don't create that connectivity and that fluidity of of movement and fluidity of use that Jane Jacobs talked about. And we took a essentially a rural model of highways where you have the big highway between the cities and then the smaller uh, collector street distributing the highway traffic. And then you have finally the, the more local streets. We took that model and we imposed it on into the city and we created that pattern all over the United States and all over the world ultimately. Um, this is again a neighborhood unit 
uh, pattern. It's quite a uh, beautiful pattern, but again, the, the functions are segregated uh, and it's, uh, the, the uses are, and this is actually much better in terms of what we would think of today as, as functional segregation than many other examples. But nonetheless, it is, it is going down that slippery slope of pulling the functions of the neighborhood apart and creating the, what's now known as the functional classification system and the, um, uh, the, the, essentially the Perry diagram that we saw earlier. If you think about going back to this diagram on the left, so there's the civic uses in the middle, there's the arterials surrounding it and the commercial uses only on the edges um, and everything else is pulled apart and there are no real through streets to get you through that neighborhood. Everything sort of swoops around and you, you, you wouldn't want to cut through there because you'd get lost and you wouldn't be able to connect through. So you're only going to be on the highway and, and it's a very large diameter. It's half a mile in diameter. So that everything, um, the, the number of vehicles, the amount of movement at the perimeter is very high as a result of that. It's not a very fine grained movement pattern. So what you end up with is on the left here, this is the pattern that has been used all over the United States in many, many, many uh, examples. Uh, I'll show you an example from Phoenix in a moment where you have the civic use in the middle, you have a little park and maybe a school, and then you have the big fat arterials on the perimeter. Maybe they're at about a one mile or half a mile spacing. Um, and then you have all the commercial uses, the big strip malls on uh, the corner intersections. Um, and once again, that's the, that's the rural pattern. You have the big fat arterials that used to go between the cities and now they're going within the cities. And then you have the collectors that bring the major streets into the middle of the neighborhood. And then you have the local streets that in effect become a kind of spaghetti bowl of different uh, street patterns that go nowhere, that just sort of swoop around and, and end up with uh, you know um, uh, getting ultimately to your house. But you can't get around very easily from your house without getting into your car. It's a really car dependent pattern, just as it would be in a rural settlement because uh, you would need a vehicle typically to get around in a rural settlement. So here's, um, uh, here's the example from uh, Phoenix where you can see exactly that pattern. You look close, closely at any one of these squares and you will see lo and behold, there's a little park in the middle uh, or a school or something like that. And um, if, you, if you look carefully, you can see that you actually can't get through. It looks like these are through streets that go through in the middle here, but they don't. They actually collide with something and they get interrupted and you can't get through. And that's deliberate because they want you to move out to these wider arterials, these big fat uh, arterials that are really only for cars. Um, and that again, goes back to Le Corbusier and his model that we were going to um, essentially create super blocks, right? And then the, within the super block, everything was pedestrianized. Everything was, um, you know, you didn't have vehicles. And then where you had the vehicles, you had a lot of vehicles and nothing else. You had a, essentially a, a, a very fast, very dangerous, uh, high emissions uh, automobile corridor uh, and vehicle, vehicular corridor. So again, we lost this tissue, this connective tissue that I had talked about earlier and that you can see in the analyses of people like Bill Hillier, where you have a very fine grained connectivity pattern uh, and a very intricate tissue of walkability. London is a very, very walkable city. I can tell you, I lived there uh, for a couple of years uh, and uh, it, it's because it has this pattern. It, it was not uh, built as a modern city. It was built as a very fine grained interconnected uh, traditional city following that pattern. You can see the same thing in Rome, for example, this going back to the Noli plan that we talked about before uh, that has the uh, very intricate tissue of, of spaces, very complex and very irregular looking. But actually, if you look carefully, you can see that it does have a grid like pattern. Um, and you can see this is what it looks like today, by the way, where the, some of the more modern streets have been cut through. But nonetheless, you can see a lot of the same uh, tissue there, uh, again, self-organizing into a very complex dynamic pattern, lots of, lots of centers, lots of little cellular spaces that you can be and that you can move. And again, a roughly grid-like pattern running through it, much more orderly than it might seem at first glance. 
um, and um, and yet still very complex and very uh, uh, deflected and very uh, uh, intricate spaces, uh, large spaces, small spaces, many spaces in between, and a very wonderful city, very wonderful uh, to explore uh, on foot and to to uh, to be in and to uh, experience as somebody who who lives there, who's who's visiting there. Um, and again, you can see large spaces, medium spaces, small spaces, uh, many different scales of, of uh, spaces and spatial enclosures down to the private spaces as well, the place network, as I referred to it earlier. And you can see that in many other examples. This is uh, Trafalgar Square in London, um, really wonderful uh, example where you have um, the big spaces and the uh, public spaces and the smaller spaces where people can gather many different areas within that larger space that create zones, uh, create activities. Uh, they, while I was there actually, they took the street out that was severing the connection between the, uh, you can see on the left there, the, the connection between Trafalgar Square and the uh, museum on the left. Um, they removed that and reconnected the space. And uh, Bill Hillier was actually involved in analyzing that and he predicted that many more people would use the space as a result of that. And lo and behold, the, the, uh, the modeling was very accurate. It accurately predicted how much more use that square would get as a result of that. Other uh, connection uh, projects that have been <clears throat> built, the, the new bridge over the Thames um, that goes to over to St. Paul's, uh, creating a lot more uh, uh, movement and a lot more activity on either end of that bridge. You know, we talked about that going down to the level of a building, how you can have these spatial networks and, and uh, 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 networks, connections of, of, of site as well as connections of movement. Sometimes the site can be axial and the movement can be a perimeter movement and so on, like this courtyard house. Uh, and that's a more complex pattern, as I and we talked about the other day, than this sort of simplified, very axial tree-like structure. If you have more of a network that interconnects, that has the this density of interconnections within it, as well as to the exterior, uh, and you can see that over and over again in Rome, where you have again the connections, the interior connections, the perimeter connections, and the connections to the exterior as well, forming a very, very complex, well-connected uh, structure, uh, well-connected tissue. And again, it's in three dimensions, not just two dimensions. So you have these uh, relationships sometimes just of, of sight because you're, you know, you're up looking down or down looking up or whatever, uh, or sometimes they are you know, stairwells and, and so on that connect the, the different levels. Very complex, spatially uh, up and down, right and left, front and back. Um, and, and it's wonderful to explore these cities and to just marvel in their complexity and the complexity of the different spaces that they form and how uh, the deflections, the relationships of the views as you're walking down the street, the serial progression uh, of experiences as Gordon Cullen wrote about in his wonderful book, Townscape, uh, where we, we can make that happen. We can think about that as we're working with the city and transforming the city and designing the city and creating these networks, creating these um, cellular spaces, uh, courtyards and plazas and, and uh, perimeter uh, bays and so on. Um, and th this is you know something that we once thought of in fairly uh, simplistic terms, primitive terms, you might say, we're now beginning to recognize how actually complex these spaces can be and how these networks of movement and site, uh, these place networks are, um, are so rich and complex. So um, for the last part of the talk, I wanna go back to a topic that we talked about yesterday and apply it to some of the issues that we're talking about today, how cities have evolved as spatial structures and as particular kinds of structure uh, that in some cases we have chosen, and in some cases we have uh, had consequences that are not happy ones as a result of those choices. Uh, and so I want to go back to the point, and Dominic, you've probably dealt with this in your, uh, in your work with mathematics, the idea of an attractor, um, which again comes out of Renee Tom's work uh, and the uh, catastrophe theory and, and uh, uh, the, the theory of, uh, of attractors. And uh, well, I'll explain that a little bit. And so the first thing I wanna say is you probably heard about strange attractors 
uh, which are what happens when you have uh, turbulent uh, phenomena. And this happens all the time in natural systems, you know, the famous uh, you know, uh, pendulum experiment where the pendulum gyrates in this really weird pattern, but it doesn't actually leave a certain region because it's constrained by the dynamics of the phenomenon to uh, certain regions. And the, sometimes it can be two regions as in this example on the right. And that's what those are called strange attractors because we're not quite sure why. I mean, it's a very complex phenomenon that is producing those attractors, those places where the spirals are you know, sort of centered on the right. And uh, Charles Jinks, the architectural theorist said, well, this is a new cosmology, you know, complexity and, and um, uh, chaos and so on. And so we're, we can use this as art for our expression of new ideas and a new uh, place in the cosmos and so on. And, um, and he actually did some landscape designs where there were literally uh, diagrams of attractors that he built. And they're interesting and they're maybe lovely sculptures, but I think what he's doing is he's sort of, it's almost like taking blueprints and making buildings out of the blueprints rather than using the blueprints to make the buildings, using the idea of a strange attractor to inform the way that we make buildings rather than make, copying the image of a strange attractor in the building or in the landscape. That's a profound difference, I think. And uh, so, you know, there's a, uh, a lot of work on this topic. Again, Dominic, you may be familiar with uh, a lot of this work already, the, what's known as a, as a regular attractor or a strange attractor, which behaves more chaotically. Uh, and it has a relationship to the other patterns that we've seen that are emergent structures, fractals, and so on, uh, because this is the way that uh, dynamic phenomena uh, manifest themselves in space in many different examples. So let me give you an a, a elementary example of what an attractor is. And I'll use this example of a beach. Let's say it's one mile long, or you could say one kilometer, 1.6 kilometers or whatever. Um, and then you have a, a guy who's selling ice cream on the beach, okay? And then you have somebody else who's selling ice cream on the beach. You would think, well, the most rational and orderly way to organize their position is to say each of them is uh, one quarter mile or one quarter kilometer apart or whatever, right? So now it's nicely organized. Everybody's got uh, you know, a quarter mile on one side, a quarter mile on the other side, and then the boundary line between them, they've each got the same amount of territory, right? Well, that's not what actually happens in reality. Because what happens in reality is that if you if this guy sets up first, then the next guy who comes along is going to say, oh, guess what? I'm going to go here because what is he going to do? He's going to get all of the other uh, business from all the rest of the beach. And now he's going to get a lot more business than this guy is going to get. And that's because it's a dynamic phenomenon. It's not static. It's a self-organizing phenomenon. And there it's self-organizing around an attractor that the first guy has now created, namely the spot right next to him, right? So that's an attractor. So now this guy gets three quarters of a mile and the other guy gets a quarter of a mile. Um, but what happens if you say, well, why don't we uh, put you both together? Um, that would actually, if, you, if they were both sitting there at the same time and somebody you know, pulled a starter gun and said, go find the best place to get, they would probably go here. Why? Because now they have each balanced out the other. They each get half a mile of, of, of the beach uh, uh, for their market. Uh, and now they're each getting the same amount of um, uh, beach business, the kids coming and buying the ice cream. And this is what happens, by the way, commercially all the time. You'll see the uh, suddenly the birds of a feather that are flocking together. You'll see the same fast food restaurants all in one spot. You'll see the same, um, you know, uh, big box shopping shopping uh, stores all in one spot. It's the same phenomenon that's going on. They're, they're being attracted to this point. And the logic of the situation, the dynamics of the situation create that attractor basin and the attractor point that they're all attracted to. Uh, in order to resolve the dynamics of that particular problem. And that's what uh, is an attractor and, and what an, is an attractor point, um, attractor basin and attractor point. Notice that those exist 
<clears throat> already, even if you don't have the ice cream uh, stores, you might have somebody selling a couple of people selling sandals, or you might have a couple of people renting surfboards. It's the same attractor basin. It's the same dynamics of the environment that's being created as a result of that. <clears throat> and so this is the idea of an attractor. Now a structural attractor is kind of like the situation at the beach where you say there's actually a point on the beach, a physical point that is organizing uh, the people or activities around it. And similarly, you could say a structural attractor is a point, is a structure that is organizing the response to a problem in the most efficient way. So if you think about, for example, the, the shape of a dolphin's um, uh, 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 dorsal fin, uh, and you say, look at the shape of a shark's dorsal fin, they're almost identical. And yet those are creatures that have evolved very, very far apart in time, about 350 million years. You could also see many of the same shapes in different, very different species, worms and snakes, for example, or different leaf patterns that take on the same sort of serrated shape, even though they've evolved entirely separately. So how have different forms of evolution produced the same structure? And this is because, as, as Brian Goodwin, the biologist, pointed out, there are structural attractors that are producing the same response to the same complex dynamics. Um, if you think about the dolphin's dorsal fin and the shark's dorsal fin that are the same, um, that they have the same problem to solve, the same very complex structural forces, the, um, the laminar flow and the, the, the dynamics of turbulence of water and so on, all of these things that are going on. And it turns out that there is a particular shape that uh, that resolves the, that problem. There's a particular structural attractor that is the solution to that problem that produces the same shape over and over and over again, regardless of where it exists in history. Uh, it can be you know, 240 million years apart or whatever. And so um, one of the interesting questions that I think we can ask when we're thinking about the evolution of cities is can we see something similar happen in the human environment? Can we see structural attractors? For example, what if you need to create uh, doorways uh, that are about the same shape as a human being? Remember, we were talking about the pattern door and the fact that the forces had to be similar in order for the pattern to work. But the pattern doorway is about the same. It's about you know one meter wide and two meters tall or whatever. And lo and behold, you'll see that same shape across cultures and across evolutionary periods of architecture because it's a structural attractor. It's a way of resolving the need of a human being who is about a meter wide and, and two meters tall or whatever. Um, how about the shape of a roof that sheds rain uh, and rain exists around the globe, of course. And lo and behold, you'll see the same sort of uh, voltage uh, roof shape in cultures around the world because it sheds rain, sheds snow, sheds, uh, you know, deflects the wind and so on. Um, it has the same structural attractor that resolves the problem. How about uh, holding up a structure, um, creating an efficient form to support a heavy load? Again, a column structure that has a, a highly articulated uh, capital and a highly articulated base, because if you know anything about the structural dynamics, you know that that is where the moment is the greatest, where the, the bending forces are the greatest to try to topple that structure. And lo and behold, you'll see the same structure across cultures, across uh, uh, history, uh, and often re reflected in other ways with ornamental details and so on, because it's also responding to human cognition and human experience as well. So we can see that the human environment is richly um, responsive to the patterns of evolution, the patterns of structure that are recurrent, the solutions that are recurrent to uh, the problems that are recurrent. Uh, and you can see that these are structural attractors that are doing that. But here's the problem. What happens if we say, well, okay, here are these attractor basins and some of them are, are uh, you know, a bit chaotic. We don't quite understand what they are. We can't define them precisely. There may be strange attractors or whatever, but they're still attractors and we know what they are. Um, but now we say, no, 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 we can't do that anymore. We have to be novel. Everything has to be new and exciting. It has to be of our time. Uh, 
So we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. Oh, stop. We can't do any of that stuff from before, let's say 1920 or 1930. Everything has to be different. We can't do the vaulted roof anymore. We can't do the simple column anymore. We can't do any of that stuff. Everything has to be really wild and different and sculptural. It has to be uh, uh, new, exciting, a new piece of artwork, something nobody's ever seen before. So now what are we doing? We're creating um, more and more uh, exceptional uh, examples that are harder and harder to solve the problems that we have for human beings. Uh, we're, we're pushing that line up and, and making it harder and harder to find the solution to uh, that problem. Uh, you know, we're, we're essentially painting ourselves into a corner of solution space, you might say, by demanding novelty, by demanding that we not use any of this stuff from the past. No, no, we mustn't do that because that wouldn't be authentic to our time. This is not um, um, a universal idea in human history. It's a very unique idea, a very weird idea, I would say, certainly from an evolutionary point of view, uh, this idea that we must have only the architecture of our time. Uh, now, I'm not talking about imitating the look of a place, and there's some very weird examples of that where they uh, imitated uh, England in China, they've imitated Hallstatt in uh, uh, the beautiful uh, Austrian town in China, and, and other examples of that. It's not about copying the look of something, it's about the deeper grammar of expressing the uh, the form language of, a, of an earlier time, and the greatest architecture in history has done that over and over again. If you look at London, uh, violating the architecture of its time by using Roman and Greek precedents and so on, right? Uh, and very effectively, very beautifully, uh, this is the uh, 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 beautiful British Museum there. Um, that's a, obviously a very Roman and Greek uh, uh, form. Um, Thomas Jefferson, who recapitulated Palladio, uh, Palladio recapitulated Vitruvius, uh, Vitruvius recapitulated the Greeks, and so on and so forth. These were violations of their time, going back hundreds and hundreds of years, by the way, not just 50 years or so, um, two millennia out of their time, for example. And many of the greatest cities around the world, I would say, are examples of this, of you know, what, what now uh, we, as in following the sort of modernist doctrine, of our time, everything must be of its time. New Orleans has violated that. Uh, many other great cities around the world have violated that and they're all the better for it. So I think if, when we understand this aspect of evolution, this aspect of mathematics, all of these ideas take on a very different light and a very um, simplistic and, and uh, uh, simple thinking and wrong thinking uh, light, I would say. Um, the, uh, the freedom to recapitulate forms is something that has happened throughout history. This is in uh, uh, Covent Garden. And that structure on the left is a new structure that recapitulates the great um, example of the Crystal Palace, which was built in the mid 1800s. So why is that a bad thing if it works, if it's, if it's successful, if it's well loved, uh, you know, and, and all of the structures of London and Paris and many other cities are examples of very successful, durable, well loved uh, uh, human uh, hum places that are successful from a human point of view. Uh, London is full of those. Uh, many other places are full of those. Now, I want to just close on one other point. Of course, there's a place for innovation and novelty. It's a weave. It's a fabric. You know, you might say that we've gotten too far into thinking about everything as an icon, as a, an expression of its time, the semiotic uh, approach to architecture, as opposed to the post-semiotic uh, approach, the integration of semiotics into uh, the environment as just one component of a larger fabric. The idea of a static structure versus a dynamic structure, the structural attractors and so on, the unalterable versus the evolutionary and the adaptive, the intentional versus the emergent, the large scale formalist, which we've seen way out of, uh, out of proportion, I think in the 20th century into the 21st and the fine grained urban. And then a single instance of visual and sculptural culture uh, 
uh, by the way, joined with a bunch of other singular instances into this big sort of chaotic jumble, a giant sculpture garden, if you will, versus a diverse set of experiences and potentials, which is what I think the city is, what I think all great cities are. Um, so I'm sorry that I've gone almost all the way to the end of the uh, period here, uh, but obviously this is a, a rich topic and I love talking about the uh, examples of great cities from whatever period and whatever culture, the incredible diversity that's out there. Um, and yet the very sort of dumbed down uh, simplistic thinking that has somehow lumped all of that together, everything from about before 1920 to into some big amalgam of, I don't know, uh, colonial or, um, or ancient or um, reactionary of the past, um, no longer relevant to the modern world, et cetera, et cetera. All these sort of really fantasy ideas that are not grounded in the science. They're simply grounded in, in uh, characterizations that, oh, no, no, this is all one thing. When actually, if you look at it carefully as a structure, you find that it's incredibly diverse and incredibly complex and incredibly emergent. And there's much that we can learn from it, not as a, um, uh, again, as, a, as an image, but as a deeper generative uh, set of forces that we can tap into. Uh, so anyway, Dominic, do you have comments on that? I'm sorry, I didn't leave much time. Yeah, thank you very much. Everything was really fascinating. Thank you, for instance, for linking to human evolution. Mm -hmm. An interesting issue. I'm keen on history and biology, so I, so I really enjoyed this topic uh, at, at school. Till today, I remember some Latin names of successive stages of human evolution, such as um, Australopithecus ramidus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, yeah. right. finally Homo sapiens. Indeed, the evolution of life forms and habitation of these people is a very long and interesting story. And thanks to you, I was able to supplement my knowledge acquired at school in this area. Um, in this context, uh, I believe that urbanism was born with the emergence of settlement forms uh, among humans. Uh, I don't know what you think about it, but uh, in my opinion, uh, to some extent, the transition to a nomadic way of life can be considered as the birth of a certain primitive form of urbanism, mm -hmm. but it was still the beginning of shaping its history. Um, That's right, I, I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, during your lecture, you also referred to the building culture of Central and South America. And I think that uh, nowadays people, many people still underestimate the architectural as well as urban achievements of ancient cultures, considering yes. them primitive or not known enough, knowing mainly Machu Picchu, and etc. And uh, I like to watch historical programs on TV and uh, uh, more and more, more and more uh, um, achievements in this topic. I have watched uh, fairly new programs made by historians and other researchers uh, literally two, three, four years ago. And I'm gigantically impressed by what things they discover and how monumental structures are still unknown to us today. Yeah. For example, exactly. in one episode, researchers have found a huge structure in South America, partially buried and partially overgrown by trees in the heart uh, of a very dense forest. Uh, on another occasion, they came across some bricks, so they started to excavate, which went on and on. And eventually, it was found that underground, there was a gigantic street tract, extremely well planned mm -hmm. and coordinated with the buildings of the time and adapted to the natural conditions of the area at that time. Yeah. What is more, these researchers wondered how it was possible to create such structures if the region did not have the suitable building material. Mm -hmm. And historians have wondered how, the, how these people were able to bring building materials over such great distances to their place of residence. Yeah. Looking at the achievements 
achievements of uh, the civilizations of Central and South America, the achievements of ancient Egypt and other cultures. Uh, I have been impressed for many years by the ancient planning and architectural thought of the time. And it is fascinating that a few thousand years ago, people without university studies, without formal engineering training, were able to plan and build such massive, reliable, and often very durable buildings and streets that really have survived to our times. Yes, so it was a really fascinating topic. It, it is fascinating, isn't it? And we're, we're really privileged, I think, to live in a time where so much is now being discovered. And, uh, you know, speaking of, of Egypt and, and Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, then the, the incredible um, architecture, incredible civilizations there that we didn't recognize and still haven't really um, given uh, enough credit in, in Asia and many other parts of the world. And it was fascinating that many of these things emerged over time uh, in, at, at about the same time um, in, in many different parts of the world. Um, it's quite, quite fascinating. One quick thing I think you'll appreciate uh, as a, a, with your background in mathematics is uh, um, not long ago, uh, somebody noted that the uh, the pyramids, the ratio of the pyramids, the height to the perimeter was pi. Uh, yeah. And they said, ah, the Egyptians knew pi, you know, um, and this was like really exciting. But then they finally recognized that the layout tool that they were using was a wheel and they would use the wheel to mark out the perimeter. And then yeah. they would use the diameter, a multiple of the diameter of the wheel to calculate the height. So they didn't know pi, but they were using pi because they were using the wheel. They were yeah. using the, the circumference and the radius of the wheel to get the two geometries. So, you know, many of these things are just a matter of applying the way nature works. You know, that's what mathematics is ultimately is the, the ratios and the, the, the symmetries that exist in the world that we're just capturing in our, in our language. And uh, so it's, it's all really wonderful. and. Uh, um, fascinating to think about and I think important for us to um, to think about the implications and how we need to change the ways that we're doing things, the ways that we're building cities, the ways that we're thinking about cities and, and modernity uh, in relation to um, uh, you know our history and our evolution and so on. So I've taken you uh, beyond the uh, uh, 530 limit so uh, I'm sure you're ready to get ready for dinner and, and so on. And I'll, uh, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Thank you very much to, for today. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Bye.